Welcome to The Real News Network, coming to you today from our studio in Toronto. There's a magazine in the United States, you can see it here, it's see up here, FP, and it features an article which more or less asks the question, is Karl Marx relevant today? Well, FP does not stand for fomenting the proletariat. It's a magazine called Foreign Policy, and I'm the, the article that mostly deals with this is, uh, you can see here, is a piece called Thoroughly Modern Marx, and it's written by our guest today, Leo Panitch. Thanks for joining us, Leo. Hi, Paul. Leo is professor of political economy, political science at York University, also author of the book, Renewing Socialism. So, Leo. Is Marx relevant today? Now, just so uh, I'm going to show you this again because it's kind of a cute cover, I suppose. But what you see here is, is Marx relevant, and what they have here is a bunch of bread all around Marx's face. The nose is a, is a potato. The uh, eyes are megaphones of some sort, which I suppose means propaganda, a hammer and a sickle. So I, I guess Leo, we're, we're to take from this as Marx is equivalent to we will all be equal because we'll all eat bread and potatoes. So. Well, what, no, what do you I'm, make of this? I'm not sure that the cover, which is very arresting but somewhat bizarre, um, really gets at what they were looking for by way of the article. Uh, they, in, in tracking me down to do it, uh, which they did via my publisher in London, uh, having heard that uh, the editor of the Socialist Register presumably knows something about Marx, they thought that Marx needed to be taken seriously as an analyst of the crisis. It wasn't so much about, you know, what would socialism be. It was much more uh, Marxism or Marx's Das Kapital, they imagined, gave us the basic clues for understanding the current crisis. So what, what does that tell us, first of all, about American culture, American intelligentsia, that, that probably, arguably, uh, neck and neck with the Bible, the works of Marx are probably the most read works in history, and certainly to do with political economy, clearly are the most read works in the history of, of humanity. Uh, what does it tell us that it's such a big deal that you've got to ask this question? Well, it's very interesting. I think it does reflect the ideological crisis of uh, neoliberalism, of free market ideology, of Hayek and Friedman and so on. There's no, I think it was already taking a very, very big beating. It reminds me of that moment when Alan Greenspan testifying in front of Congress has to say, well, oh, there was a hole in our theory. <laughs> exactly. I never imagined that these banks would not take care of their own bottom line, you know, that we might have to look after it for them. Um, yeah, no, so yes, the Ayn Rand ideology that, that Greenspan uh, founds his thinking on. It has been taking a big hit. It was taking a hit before the crisis because it was so clear that neoliberal globalization was not developing large parts of the world and that even in the parts of the world it was developing, a hell of a lot of people were suffering. And that gave rise to the anti-globalization movement. And already you could see before the crisis at meetings like Davos, uh, they were responding in a way that we're trying to get social justice issues discussed at these meetings of the world elite. Um, but with this crisis, you, it, it's really taken a hit. I mean, the gloss is off. So this also then immediately produces, well, what analysts are there of why this thing was full of contradiction? And what's so interesting is that Marx has been so unfashionable, not only in the media, et cetera, but in the universities. And, you know, postmodernism and post-structuralism, which are primarily literary theories have no interest in the economy. So, you know, neoclassical economics, the voodoo that's taught about supply and demand and price theory uh, in our economics departments, it's appalling stuff. And then what's taught in the sociology departments these days is culturalist, uh, that, that ignores capitalism. Uh, where do they turn to? Uh, some of them turn to Keynes and Schumpeter, but you know, if you're really going to find something exciting in a popular magazine, it's not going to be Schumpeter. It's going to be Marx. And they're turning to it. And what's astonishing is what I wrote, I thought they'd never publish. You know, I said Marx would not be offering policy advice to uh, governments about what is to be done in the face of this crisis. He would tell people to overcome their social, social isolation form new collective organizations and identities, and make a social revolution. They went gaga over it. 
and put it on the front cover, to my amazement. In your uh, article, you talk about the issue of the derivatives and the financial speculation and the crisis that resulted therefrom. But you also talk about some of the basic things that Marx talks about, which has to do with the impoverishment of working people and the reliance on credit and, and all of this issue, which is not something that people seem to want to discuss very much. Everyone wants to focus on the financial shenanigans, and nobody wants to talk about some of the basic contradictions within the economy. Yeah, and they assumed that uh, what Marx was famous for was uh, talking about financial speculation in the 19th century and therefore that he was you know, foreseeing Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and so on. And I had to insist against some of their editing that they leave in phrases like commodity production uh, and the contradictions of accumulation, the falling rate of profit, uh, you know, those things that go on in the sphere of production that aren't just about banks and financial speculation. And yes, I think it, it's the, their perception, which can be corrected, and they did run the piece, uh, needs to be, in a Marxian sense, clarified. One of the points you make in the article is that, it's, it, that the real romantics, or the real utopians, are, are the reformers, and, I, and to some extent I guess you think the Obama camp, who think you can have capitalism without these profound crises if only you had better technocratic management. Exactly. Uh, they're the real uh, utopians. Uh, Marx was the much greater realist. You cannot take crisis out of the system. Uh, and yes, that does have to do with, as you said, the social relations that uh, produce exploitation, the nature of commodity production and market production, which is so unplanned. There is no hidden hand that guides the market. And the Obama administration, of course, the Canadian administration, uh, but Obama particularly because they have had some rhetoric in other ways, are so wedded to this free market model that even when it comes to something like climate change, uh, th it's only this uh, cap-and-trade free market solution. Which so, depends on derivatives. So, so in the next segment of our interview, we're going to talk about is Marx relevant to some very specific issues. So we're going to deal with climate change, and then we're going to do a segment on health care, we're going to do a segment on banking, and we're going to do a segment on something else. And I can't remember what it was, but by the time we get there, we'll know. So please join us for the next segment of our interview with Leo Panich. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington, there's a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said this is going to change everything. And the way our country is governed is going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matter. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing 
that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest news system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.